In part two of lecture 11 on the digestive system, we're going to be talking about the small intestine. Material is once again from chapter 23 in Merib. So there are three major portions to the small intestine. The duodenum, which comes immediately after the stomach, the jejunum, which is the middle part of the small intestine, and the ileum, which is the last or terminal part of the small intestine that connects with the large intestine, and in fact connects with the cecum, as we'll see a little later. The duodenum is what's called the mixing bowl. What this does actually is mix the chyme from the stomach with buffers to neutralize the acid in the chyme and also mix with enzymes that come from the pancreas as well as bile that comes from the gallbladder and the liver. So there's a lot of things that get mixed together inside the duodenum and so for this reason we refer to this as the mixing bowl. So this is the first segment that begins right here after the pylorus of the stomach and continues to about right here. It's about uh, 12 inches or so long. The second segment of the small intestine is called the jejunum, and this is really the business end of the small intestine in terms of completing digestion and then absorbing the nutrients that are digested. This is the longest segment of the small intestine, and it continues right down to someplace around over here. You can't really see exactly where it is, but it continues from where the duodenum ends until the ileum begins. And the last segment of the small intestine is the ileum. So in this terminal segment of the small intestine, one of the important things that happens is vitamin B12 is absorbed. However, remember we said that in the stomach, vitamin B12 has to bind with intrinsic factor from the parietal cells, or it does not get absorbed in the small intestine. So vitamin B12 absorption in the ileum is dependent upon the binding with intrinsic factor. Now the main functions overall of the small intestine are chemical digestion, as you see here, and absorption of nutrients. About 90% of all nutrients that are present in the chyme that comes from the stomach get absorbed from the small intestine. So it's very highly efficient at absorbing. Now there are some things that we looked at before when we looked at the overall anatomy of the digestive system. One of those was mesentery. If you remember we talked about a mesentery proper and you see the mesentery here, all this yellow material in here, this fatty material with blood vessels, nerves, lymphatics, this is the mesentery that surrounds the entire small intestine. The small intestine and the large intestine together are normally referred to as the bowel. Now what about the blood supply and drainage of the small intestine? This is actually super easy. The main vessel that supplies the small intestine is the superior mesenteric artery. So the superior mesenteric artery is a branch of the abdominal aorta and the entire small intestine is drained by the superior mesenteric vein. Easy to remember, right? Just one vessel supplying, one vessel leaving, and they both have the same name. Remember that the veins from all abdominal organs enter into the hepatic portal vein, which we see here, and the blood from the small intestines is then gonna go into the liver to be processed and eventually make it into the inferior vena cava. Now let's talk a little bit about the structure of the small intestine. You might remember this from when we did an overview of the digestive system and we took a look at some structural modifications of the alimentary canal. Now the small intestine has the same layers that we talked about earlier and you'll notice them here. We have a mucosa which is in here. We have a submucosa. There's a muscularis externa and finally there's a serosa on the outside. Now remember the muscular layer consists of two separate layers of muscle. There's a circular and a longitudinal layer of muscle here. Unlike the stomach, we do not have an oblique layer in this. There are only two layers of muscle in the muscularis externa of the small intestine. Now as you can see, the small intestine is thrown into these folds, which are known as plicae circularis. Now these are permanent folds of mucosa that increase the surface area for absorption. These don't flatten out like the rugae of the stomach do. Another thing they do is they more or less act like speed bumps. So as the food moves through here, it's kind of stopped a little bit and the contact with the wall is prolonged. So the material in here has more time to get digested and get absorbed. Now let's take a close up of this. You'll notice this small square up here. We're gonna blow this section up. You'll notice first of all that these major folds that we have here, this for example, sticking in like this and this and this, these are the plicae circularis. So the plicae circularis are the big folds in the small intestine. Now, on top of the plicae circularis, we have villi. These are finger-like projections that project from the plicae circularis. And as we'll see in the next slide, we actually have more modifications on the villi themselves. Remember the microvilli, and we'll see those in the next slide. 
This type of structure with the plique circularis, the villi, the microvilli, this is especially prominent in the duodenum and the upper jejunum. These are the areas of the small intestine where the bulk of digestion and absorption takes place. Now in the submucosa of the duodenum, we have mucus secreting glands that are known as Brunner's glands that protect the small intestine. If you remember, the duodenum is receiving acidic chyme from the stomach. And although we have buffers that are secreted by the bile ducts, by the pancreatic ducts, it may take some time to neutralize the acid that's in the chyme. So there is a layer of mucus in the duodenum. However, it's not nearly as thick as the layer of mucus that we saw in the stomach to protect it from acids and digestion. Now let's take a close up of the wall of the intestine. So all these little finger-like projections here are villi. We're looking at a section through a villus here and you'll notice that we have cells that line the villus. All of these cells that you see that line the villus and that are the epithelial lining of the small intestine are known as enterocytes. So the main intestinal cells are known as enterocytes. Scattered in between there, we have mucus cells or goblet cells. So this is where some of the mucus comes from. There also are some glands present in the submucosa, as we just said, especially in the duodenum, that secrete some mucus as well. If we look at the structure of the villus, you'll notice the villus comes all the way down, and the cells actually go below the surface of the mucosa here and make sort of a pit. And these are called intestinal glands. And inside the intestinal glands, there are cells that secrete an abundant watery fluid that basically helps to mix all the products that are inside the intestine and help absorb those. There are enteroendocrine cells. These cells secrete enterokinase. Hopefully you remember that from activation of the pancreatic proteolytic enzymes. They also contain gastrin, remember the GO hormone for digestion, secretin, which upregulates the production and secretion of bicarbonate and phosphate buffers from the bile ducts and pancreatic ducts, and finally our buddy CCK. Remember, CCK has those four important functions in digestion, and this is the major hormone that ties digestion to processing of the material that we take in. There are also some other cells down the bottom of these intestinal glands. These are known as panath cells. Not too much is known about panath cells, but what they're believed to be is involved in innate resistance. They secrete some substances when they're exposed to bacteria or some other microorganisms that are harmful to just a general class of microorganisms. Now, if we look at a cross-section of a villus, you'll notice several things. We see a blood vessel, an arterial blood vessel, a venous blood vessel. In the center is something that we mentioned before when we looked at the structure of the overall alimentary canal. This is known as a lacteal. And a lacteal is nothing more than a lymphatic capillary. As we mentioned earlier, most products of digestion are brought from the intestinal cells into the blood, in fact, into the venous blood here. However, one class of products from digestion, that is namely fatty acids and fats, those are too big to get into the blood vessels, so they get absorbed into the lacteals. And we'll talk about that process uh, in a couple of slides. Okay, so as I mentioned, the intestinal cells are also called enterocytes, that is cells of the intestine. And here you can see a light histomicrograph of the intestinal glands. So you see these small pits down here, which are called intestinal glands. And these will be some of the cells that we just went over. Now, if we take a close-up of the cells that line the villi, that is the enterocytes. This is an enterocyte right here. There's one right next to it here. And here you can see this tight junction between the two cells. Remember from AMP1, we said that a tight junction was designed to force material to go through the cells, but not between cells. Okay, so the tight junctions force the material through the enterocytes so that they can properly process the material. Now, if you look on the surface of each enterocyte, you'll see microvilli. And as we said before, microvilli increase the surface area for absorption. That is, they increase the amount of contact that the cells have between the material that's in the intestine and the cells themselves. On the surface of this, you'll notice all this kind of fuzzy stuff. These are all digestive enzymes and sugars, glycoproteins. So these are actually coming directly in contact with the food material that's moving past this. And these enzymes we'll look at in a second continue the breakdown that was started in the prior portions of the intestine and the stomach. So the microvilli, if you remember from AMP1, form something that's called a brush border because of the way this looks under a light microscope. It looks sort of like the edge of a paintbrush. And the digestive enzymes are embedded in the membrane of the microvilli, as we just pointed out. Now, the main function of the plique circularis, the villi, and the microvilli is to increase the surface area for absorption. And this is really a tremendous increase. It goes from about four square feet 
to about 2,200 square feet. I'll give you an example, four square feet is two feet on a side. On the other hand, 2,200 square feet would be something that was about 47 feet on each side. So that's a tremendous increase going from something that's only two feet on a side, going something that's 46 feet or 47 feet on a side. You know, we're talking about a trailer truck being a 40 footer. So you get some idea about how much the surface area is increased by just having these modifications inside the small intestine. This is really a tremendous increase in the surface area. Now, what about some of the secretions of the small intestine? The brush border of the small intestine contains things that actually complete the breakdown of material that comes from the stomach and the first part of the small intestine. For example, peptidases. What these do is they break down small tripeptides, dipeptides, into the component amino acids that will eventually be absorbed into the hepatic portal vein. Sucrase, maltase, lactase, these break down small sugars like disaccharides into monosaccharides. These will also get absorbed into the hepatic portal vein. Lipase breaks down fats into fatty acids and glycerol. Where does this get absorbed? Right. Remember, these get absorbed into the lacteals. So these take a different route. They don't go into the hepatic portal vein directly. There's enterokinase, which if you remember, converts trypsinogen into trypsin. And trypsin is the thing that activates the rest of the pancreatic proteolytic enzymes. We also have some gastrin and somatostatin secreted. We talked about those earlier. And we have our buddy CCK that's secreted from the wall of the small intestine. These two things here, remember, are hormones. So these are going into the blood. And we talked about the functions of CCK earlier. One more hormone that we have released by the intestinal wall is secretin. Very important because this causes a bicarbonate and phosphate ion rich secretion from the ducts of the pancreas and from the ducts of the gallbladder. So very important once again in neutralizing the chyme that comes into the small intestine. Now what about the movements of the small intestine? Well movements in local segments can occur without stimulation by the parasympathetic nervous system. Throughout the digestive system, as we said before, we have basically pace setter cells that automatically contract and then relax. The same is true of the segments of the small intestine. However, parasympathetic stimulation can accelerate segmentation and peristalsis. Now, peristalsis, as we said, are pushing movements that are moving food aborally. Segmentation are these ring-like contractions that aid in mixing. If too much material goes into the small intestine too fast, and it doesn't actually have a chance to absorb fluid quickly enough. And all that fluid then eventually goes into the large intestine, and this is something that's known as peristaltic rush, and this results in diarrhea. Now there are some long distance reflexes that we wanna talk about. One is known as the gastroenteric reflex, the other is known as the gastroileal reflex. Now, I want you to take a look at these names and realize that you already know whether these are gonna be stimulatory or inhibitory. Remember we talked earlier when we talked about the intestinal phase of stomach control about something called the enterogastric reflex. And we said that if the name indicates a direction opposite the flow of food, it was an inhibitory reflex. If the name is indicating flow in the same direction as the food, it's a stimulatory. Notice that this is going from stomach to intestine. Same direction as the food, therefore this is a stimulatory reflex. Same is true of the one down here, which is called the gastroileal. This goes from the stomach to the ileum, specifically. And what these reflexes do, the gastroenteric reflex promotes motility and secretion along the entire length of the small intestine. The gastroileal reflex is important because it relaxes something that's called an ileocecal sphincter. Right at the junction of the ileum and the first part of the large intestine, which is the cecum, there's a ring of smooth muscle called the ileocecal sphincter, which we'll look at later. And the gastroileal reflex is designed to relax that to allow material to go from the small intestine into the large intestine. In terms of absorption in the small intestine, monosaccharides and amino acids basically travel into the enterocytes through facilitated diffusion and active transport, and then these get absorbed to the blood, remember, via the hepatic portal vein. Electrolytes, water, also through diffusion, osmosis, active transport, once again absorbed into the blood via the hepatic portal vein. Water-soluble vitamins will be absorbed through diffusion, except vitamin B12, which is absorbed through active transport, and the water-soluble vitamins will go into the blood via the hepatic portal vein. However, the fat-soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K are really part and parcel of the fats that are going to be absorbed. And remember, these are going into the lacteals, the lymphatic capillaries in the villi of the small intestine. 
And vitamin K, as we said, since it's a fat-soluble vitamin, will also be absorbed with the other fats. Now, the last thing we want to talk about, since we mentioned it several times, is exactly how are the fats absorbed into the small intestine. So here we see the lumen of the small intestine, and the food will be traveling down this way and going past the enterocytes. So these are three enterocytes that we see here, intestinal cells. And here we see, of course, the microvilli that are lining the intestinal cells. Now what will happen is that any fats, fatty acids especially, that come down the lumen of the small intestine, as you see here, are absorbed into the enterocytes. They pass through the endoplasmic reticulum of the enterocytes, and they're actually complex with proteins and form these particles that are known as chylomicrons. Chylomicrons have fat at the center, and around that is a protein coat to make them water soluble. Now the chylomicrons are too big to get into the blood vessels, so they don't go through the hepatic portal vein. Instead, these get absorbed into the lymphatic capillaries that we refer to as lacteals. So these are taken into the lymph. These eventually will make it back to remember the subclavian veins and go back into the circulation. Fatty acids and fats that get absorbed this way actually bypass the liver entirely on the first pass, go through the lymphatics, up through the chylus cisterni, through the thoracic duct, into the subclavian vein and then make it around the circulation before actually going to the liver on the second pass. So they eventually do make it to the liver and the liver does process these fats, but not until their second time around, so to speak. Whereas amino acids and sugars, nucleic acids and nucleotides, those sort of things are gonna go directly into the liver via the hepatic portal vein. So two different mechanisms of absorption. The fat core of the chylomicron consists of triglyceride molecules, cholesterol, as well as phospholipids. So this really is a total package of dietary lipids that's surrounded by a protein coat and eventually will get to the liver and then be processed. Okay, so that finishes off part two. I'll see you next time for part three of lecture 11.